Many thanks to the organization of NYC Jewelry Week for the invitation, for the chance to talk with all of you, and also to MAD for um, inviting us to collaborate in this wonderful um, uh, room at, in a wonderful museum. So I hope you've all uh, had a chance to look at the collections too. Because what we're going to look at now, uh, I'm gonna jump really right into it with um, just a moment or two of um, sort of getting you situated. Um, I've used the term the Renaissance jewels for um, recognizability and so forth, but it's what we used to call the long Renaissance. Now, following historians, we often talk about the early modern period, which um, would be 15th, 16th, 17th century, maybe into the 18th, but I'm going to go through material from the 15th into the 17th century, so we'll see how things developed and how traditions endured. Um, and they're not, there's not going to be a focus on one particular artist or one particular style. So you're going to see lots of different artists and styles. And what I hope to alert you to, along with how the jewelry function, is the number of fantastic artists who work throughout this period that you perhaps don't um, haven't heard of up to this point. Um, many of them happen to be women, and that might be a surprise. Well, many, a good number anyway. So those are some of the ways I chose to put the material together. And for the rest of it, um, we're just going to have a chance to look at how creatively these uh, people wore their jewelry. Men and women wore a lot of jewelry, as we'll see. And then also how the artist collaborated with the sitter to make portraits of the jewelry as much as portraits of the artist, um, portraits of the sitters. Uh, it was part of their uh, self-fashioning uh, as a term that we use. And it was certainly part of their identity. And in all of these cases, their identity was absolutely linked to um, their status, uh, their privileged status of wealth and power. So all of that can be looked at through the prism of the jewelry that we see. You might wonder right away, if I'm dealing with Renaissance paintings, how do we know that that jewelry really existed? Am I just guessing or making it up? Well, um, there are three ways that a researcher would approach how the jewelry is presented. How true is it? So the three ways would be looking at an inventory that mentions the jewel and describes it. The inventories, of course, would be to um, make a note of all of the possessions of the person rich enough to own this and to pass it on through inheritances. Um, the second case, which I'm showing you an example of with this beautiful Medusa um, uh, pendant, uh, the object might survive. It doesn't happen as much as we'd like because, of course, a lot of the jewelry was transformed. The stones might have been taken out of the setting. The metals might have been melted down when cash was needed. So we don't have as many pieces as we would hope for, but many of them still do exist. So we can study the surviving objects. And finally, then, the third way would be what I'm going to focus on, and that is what we can see in the portraits. So in fact, if you go um, to the Met, you will be able to see the lovely portrait of Maria uh, Baroncelli that you're looking at now, painted by Hans Memling. And you see she's wearing an absolutely fantastic necklace. And that you might say, ah, that's gotta be a fantasy piece. Well, we don't think so because uh, there are many reasons. One is that we see it again in another portrait that uh, was painted by a different artist. And so um, in addition to the elaborate beauty of that necklace, it clearly was a piece that um, Maria decided she wanted to represent, to use to represent herself. And um, sometimes we're very lucky and we can have all three of those modes of research come together for example, in this portrait of the Duchess of Florence, Eleonora of Toledo, that Bronzino painted, 
um, we see Eleonora in a small format portrait. She is um, absolutely beautifully accessorized with lots of pearls. We'll see again, this was her favorite jewel. And um, this was a portrait, we think, that was made for her husband, the Duke of Florence, who happened to be a Medici. And as you look at the pose, she uh, puts her hand toward her breast, and um, that is certainly a gesture of love and fealty, so it's often used in portraits that are made for a partner, a spouse. Um, and what I've done then is twisted that detail around so that I orient the two rings in a way that you can see them a little bit more clearly. Uh, the one on the index finger is a diamond, and that was one of the Medici um, symbols. So that makes sense both for its preciousness and to make the point that Eleonora, from this very noble Spanish family, um, is now part of the Medici family. And that ring on her small, her little finger, um, there you have it painted and there you have it in real life. Um, this still exists in the Pitti Palace collection. Um, it was one that Eleonora loved so much that she not only had it represented in her portrait, but she was buried with it. And that is why um, it stayed with her and we can still look at it. Notice that the imagery is very much connected to her um, status as a wife of the ruling duke. You have a phoenix rising up, which certainly would be an, a symbol of eternity. You have um, cornucopias on either side of the phoenix. That, of course, for fecundity. And um, she and Cosimo had a large brood of children. Um, so that was uh, definitely uh, a, a desire that uh, came into being. And then ha hands are clasped right below that. And um, obviously, that is a very traditional uh, form of referring to um, uh, a wedding or marriage symbolism. So as I say here, this was mentioned. This ring was recorded in writing. Uh, we see it painted, and we still have, uh, luckily, the object. So let me start giving you examples where we just have the paintings. And I want to show you a few works by Lavinia Fontana, who was an artist of very high repute, painting in Bologna at the end of the 16th century. She gives us a portrait of a bride. And um, yes, in Bologna at this time, the brides wore red. Uh, she is uh, turned out with, I would say, m probably most all of the important family jewels all worn at once. And Lavinia Fontana was particularly known for the skill with which she could paint the jewels and the elaborate brocades of the, uh, the outfits that the aristocrats in this society wore. You can see that this is absolutely uh, not a minimalist approach to things. Um, I'll just mention quickly that one of the reasons people who um, had power through their wealth or their titles felt comfortable about showing, displaying all of the um, splendid possessions that they had. And I use that word because we can trace through the literature that splendor was seen to be a virtue. And so this is one of the reasons why um, the artists developed the skills of displaying it to, uh, to best advantage. So this young bride, we don't know her name. Uh, but she is wearing lots of layers. So, you know, we've been all getting into that recently. Um, we could learn a few lessons from the uh, Renaissance women. She um, has a, a kind of a collar necklace from which a large cross hangs that has a pearl pendant. That was a very um, popular kind of important jewel. Uh, to make your statement about which religion you belong to. And um, you know that these were societies where the Christians really did rule, the Catholics in particular, um, at this point. And so this was a political in many ways as well as a religious statement. Um, she wears her gold and pearl chain looped over another very large pendant, which also has then the hanging pearls, and a belt. Um, at her waist, which 
um, is uh, similar in its uh, design to the um, collar that she's wearing. These women also draped jewelry in their hair. Often they would take uh, necklaces and use them as headbands, and you'd see them painted in different ways. And by the way, um, if you look down at that little detail, the little dog that she's petting, uh, we might call it Fido, uh, or Fido, which means faith. So that is a symbol of the faithful wife in a marriage. And her other hand is holding a little tiny paw, and that is a pelt of a sable. And um, you see that the head of that sable has been encased in gold and jewels, and that was a very popular fashion accessory of the time, of course, for the very rich. While we're looking at marriage imagery, let me show you a married couple. Uh, this, I've put it with Lavinia Fontana, but um, it is contested. There's one, the curator at the Cleveland Museum where this belongs doesn't believe it, other scholars do. But um, I'm gonna put it in with her work um, and also just mention that the young woman with the splendid outfit that you saw in detail um, as a kind of symbol for this lecture was from the circle of Lavinia Fontana. So I want to make the point that she ran a very important workshop, which at a young age she took over from her father and did indeed have a circle of artists who worked with her and for her. So there are probably a lot of works that are close to her style because of that. She also uh, loved jewelry and would sometimes take jewelry as payment for her work, which not only then, shall we say, kind of fed her habit, but uh, was a very um, genteel way of receiving payment for her work. Because of course, at this time, very few women were in any of the professions. She was a professional artist. Her husband was her agent. Um, and so she had to watch that boundary between um, seeming that she was behaving in an unvirtuous way in a men's world. Um, so payment in jewelry, I think, was a great technique on her part. And here this married couple um, shows you that men also wore a lot of jewelry, not as much as women in most cases. So there is a gender distinction, but you see that he wears one heavy gold chain, she wears a number of chains of varying lengths and different kinds of um, uh, pieces put together. And of course her belt is there, his belt is also gilded, a little less um, evident than hers. But notice then the male attributes He's holding the pommel of a sword. Those could be highly decorated, and of course, jewelers would often make those. He's got a little dagger behind him. Um, so men's accessories um, were certainly um, slightly different. There are the gender distinctions, but as I say, everyone wore jewelry. The women um, would be wearing more because they remember in a marriage would bring two wealthy families together and would often then mix the family jewels. So I'll say a little bit more about that. Oh, also, you know, I'm, I can't spend too long on any of these since I'm showing you so many, but I do want to mention that this painting also gives us a clue about what was important in portraits at that time, not only saying who these people were through the jewelry and the accessories that they wore, but you might notice that at the top, to the side of their heads, there's a little bit of writing, and that's telling you the age of each of them. So we don't know who they were. We're not entirely sure who the artist was, but they, I, you know, we know their ages. And when you stop and think about it, it's because this really is a document. They wanted themselves recorded at this moment. There was something special about it, and their friends, their family, um, the others, members of their social class would know who they were when they saw the portrait. Um, and so that was not the most important information to note down. Speaking of marriage, let me show you a very different kind of portrait from a century earlier. Uh, we call these, for obvious reasons, profile portraits. And we use that as a category because there were so many of the maid, um, especially in the 1480s, and particularly in Florence, although in other places as well. These two women come from 
the shop of Piero and Antonio Polaiolo, showing you young women whom we can identify. But again, we think that these were made at the moment of their betrothal or when they were young brides. Um, that profile format um, gives you a very stylized portrait. Although you can see that they're different women, they both have fair hair, um, they both have similar hairstyles, there's, jewel, there's jewelry threaded throughout their coiffures, and um, each of them wears an important necklace with a pendant hanging down and shows you the sleeve of their garment, which is very elaborate. And again, if you're thinking about fashion accessories, in addition to the jewelry, sleeves were important. They were like our designer bags, and you could change them depending on the occasion. And as we'll see, you would sometimes embellish them even further by putting jewelry on them. So you can see one of Palaiolo's women in the Met uh, go to Milan to see the other, and then round it off by a trip to Florence, where you'll see a third in the Uffizi. Um, and when we look at the image on your right by Bonifacio Bembo, you see that uh, other areas took up the profile portrait with a little less idealization, a little less stylization. Bembo gave you what we can imagine was a very uh, close um, rendering of Bianca Maria Visconti Sforza. She united these two very powerful Milanese families and as she um, is presented to us, I've given you a detail of the brooch that she wears on her shoulder. And you see that just like the polaiolo, although it's harder to see because you see it from the side, it's not just an abstract uh, decoration, but a little figure of a person who seems to present those jewels to you. And this was a very popular fashionable brooch, again, worn only by the most wealthy. Um, you see that in the case of uh, Maria, Bianca Maria, she took a pearl necklace and pulled it across the bodice and captured it with the brooch at her shoulder. Um, we have, again, mentions of these uh, jewels that she wore in documents, and we don't have that particular one. But you'll be happy to know that one of these lady brooches exists in the British Museum, and you can get a good look at it now, along with its painted version. Um, I just took the text from the British Museum site, so you get some sense of how the curators there describe the details of this uh, shoulder brooch. And um, all of this information is uh, thanks to their curators, but again, um, as you look into this, you will be able to find some of the examples, another way of verifying that these artists were not just making them up out of fantasy. One more uh, profile portrait before we move away from, from uh, the 15th century, as we'll stay in Florence a little. Domenico Ghirlandaio gave us this portrait of Giovanna degli Albizzi Tornabuoni, again, I put their names out in full because it was a unification of two of the most powerful Medici allies. Uh, both of those families have streets named after them in Florence. They're great shopping streets, by the way, so a good name to keep in mind. And notice that Giovanna is wearing one of these, um, I'm going to call it marriage jewelry, um, and there's one on the shelf showing some of her possessions. Um, I'm guessing that perhaps one came through her family and one came through her husband's family. And since we had a look at uh, one of Ghirlandaio's paintings, I wanted to show you a case of a fantasy object. Um, I've just taken a detail from a very large painting by Ghirlandaio, and um, I've made that very intrusive blue arrow to help you focus on the two people that you, send, you then see in the detail. And this is why this era of painting really rewards very close looking. Uh, the artist expected their audience to do this. That cruciform staff is being held by John the Baptist, who you see kneeling in the foreground with that pink garment over his animal skin. But Ghirlandaio has placed it in such a way that it points out that man in black, who was the patron, paid for the painting. And while he was at it, the artist decided to put his own self-portrait in there. 
Um, he's very dashing, so I always think, well, this is what Ghirlandaio wanted us to believe he looked like, and uh, I hope it was the case. But notice that he also takes a slight step back from the patron. So you have to be decorous about all of this. And that jeweled staff, which is a fantasy object, um, first points out that patron and then the artist. I also am taking this slight tangent to make a point for you that in the 15th century, especially in the Italian tradition, it was very common for artists to have their first training as goldsmiths. And they would then go on to be painters, sculptors, even architects. But the basis in the meticulous nature of working in gold, you would start with drawings, you might engrave on gold. All of those qualities were then brought to bear on the other uh, forms of the fine arts. And this is another reason why these artists took such delight in showing you the detail of the jewelry. They uh, might have been trained in that. And as I say, the patrons wanted it because it was giving portraits of their particular family. So all of it comes together um, for these remarkable results. And even though I'm not going to emphasize the top names in Renaissance art, I had to include Maddalena Strozzi Doni from the beginning of the 16th century. You see that at that point, that very stylized, kind of flat, um, beautiful portrait done in profile was not so popular anymore. And this kind of naturalism um, of showing the full figure was something that became of more interest to people having their portraits painted. And Raphael was a great master. This is an early work of his, but already he had great skill in blending uh, a, an image of the person. Let's say if you saw her on the street, you'd probably be able to recognize. He didn't idealize it too much, but certainly showed her to her best advantage. And she looks as though she is sort of assuming the dignity of her new state, having married into the Doni family. And that large jewel that she's wearing with an emerald and a ruby and a giant uh, pearl. Look at it's placed right on the central axis. That very fair skin is a great foil for the impact of that jewel. And if you follow then that line made by the bodice of her garment with some details and jeweled buttons, her hands then also displayed for you, um, anchoring that painting, showing you her many rings. And again, showing us something about the way these women wore their jewelry. You could wear your rings on every finger. You could wear it uh, on the uh, before your knuckle on your finger, above your knuckle, or below it. So again, as we do that, we are reinventing what our um, older sisters already did in the past. Let me now um, give you some more examples of the um, identity that was conveyed through the use of jewelry. Alessandro Allori uh, gives us a portrait of Lucrezia dei Medici, and she um, married into the Este family, uh, perhaps not as much of a household world word, but they were absolutely powerful rulers of Ferrara for many generations. And so again, you get one of these dynastic marriages. Of course, when someone becomes a duke or a duchess, uh, generally, it means that the former duke has passed away. So you have both a celebration and a mourning. And this portrait shows you that. She's dressed in black, but she is wearing very important jewels. And in fact, instead of wearing that pendant, she holds it in her hand uh, to make a point that she's displaying it to you, showing you her entry into the Este family. And in fact, we know from a letter that the uh, older duke before his death gave his son jewelry to bequeath to his bride, but it was indicated very clearly. It was for her pleasure of wearing, but then it went back to the family. And so this was often the case with brides. They wore the jewelry of their new family, but then it would be passed on to later brides within the husband's family. Although, of course, they could inherit from their mother as well. Here's a young woman who was not an aristocrat, but she was very strikingly painted by her big sister. 
So here we have Minerva Anguissola by Sophonispa Anguissola. And um, we are in no doubt about the identity of this young girl because of that giant pendant that she wears. Now, this may in fact be a fantasy piece because the um, Anguissola family in Cremona were um, from the nobility, but they were not titled, they were not wealthy, and in fact, Sophonisba earned money that helped the entire family through her art. Again, very accomplished, very sought after, very successful. But when she paints her younger sister, um, that necklace with coral and the gold medallion was clearly a family jewel because we have a portrait of the mother who's wearing that. But that large one that does imitate what the aristocrats would wear um, has an image of Minerva, the classical goddess, in the center. And therefore, um, Sophonisba, all of these children in that family were given classical names by their parents. Um, so Minerva is singled out by her sister through the identification of that fabulous pendant that she's wearing um, prominently in the portrait. Well, um, Artemisia Gentileschi is another of these great painters from the early modern period, and we do know quite a lot about her now. Um, you might be familiar with the Judith slaying Holofernes, um, and perhaps you've seen it in the Uffizi. That's the one on the right. But you might not know that there was also an earlier version, and that's ended up in Naples. It was the Medici family um, who commissioned Artemisia, to do the second version for them. They wanted it in their own collection. It's a bit larger than the Neapolitan one. And I could go through many, you know, compare and contrast moments with this, but what I want you to notice, probably have already, she's wearing a bracelet in one of them, but not the other. And I'll get you closer to that. Not only is she wearing a bracelet in the later uh, painting, but look at that spray of blood that just goes around and ends up dripping on the bracelet. That is for you to pay attention to. And um, uh, when you're looking at it, your eye level is pretty much at that, if it's hung properly, um, where you're seeing the decapitation of that giant figure, but also that bracelet on Artemisia's, uh, uh, sorry, on Judith's arm. And I've just given away the punchline. Again, you can see that it's a classicizing jewel there's a figure probably of the goddess Artemis, the goddess Artemis on it. And Artemisia is therefore signing her work through her jewelry. And this of course would be important because when you get a commission from the Medici Duke, you want to make the most of it. And this would give pleasure not only to the artist for owning, as we would say, the painting that she made, but to the patron because then when guests come, he could show off the painting and say, oh, by the way, notice how the artist has signed it, and then you let your friends into this little bit of information. It's like I'm letting all of my friends into the information, and it gives you a um, way into that painting that um, not everyone would have, although we want everyone to have it. So uh, they could, artists could get very clever in the way they use their jewelry. Um, Lorenzo Lotto, who was one of the best portrait painters in Venice in the 16th century, gives us a portrait of this um, very strong looking woman named Lucina Brembati. And uh, the fact that I can tell you her name is significant. And it's because Lorenzo Lotto gave us the clues within the painting as to the identity of his sitter. So if you, for a moment, will do the one in nature quickly, um, have a look at that moon that's behind her head, and I've given it to you in detail. Can you read that there's something, a little black marking inside that sliver of moon? Those are the letters C-I. And if you know some very simple Italian or even some popular songs, you will know that Luna is moon. And if you put a CI in the middle of Luna, you get Lucina. So he tells us her name. And not only does he do that, but he displays some of the um, jewels that she owns. And um, she has this fabulous amulet 
that's hanging down with a pearl, and it looks like a little ruby on that um, hooked gold form. And um, she wears several rings, and the one ring that I've pointed out is uh, made of the coat of arms of her family. So we know that she was a member of the Brembati family. And by the way, um, she is also holding on to one of these pelts, and you can just see the little chain um, in the detail there on the right um, that holds that pelt to her outfit. Also, when you look at the uh, top of her bodice, um, this is an interesting uh, detail because it shows you that often jewels were sewn right onto the fabric. It looks to me like here we have some uh, gold braid fabric, but those little shells, um, rather than embroidery, would seem to me to be little gold medallions that hang from that braid. And as you look at more examples, you'll see that often um, precious jewels were sewn right into the fabric of the garments that um, these people would wear. Now, one other caveat, when you see these very embellished images, this is not what they would wear walking down the street every day. Uh, this would be for the most important occasions and for that memorial of defining the person in a portrait, um, showing who they are through parts of their wealth and making the identity through those objects. So a Milanese artist, Ambrogio de Predis, shows you another woman of the Sforza family. You see that her most, a very elaborate outfit all the way around, but the most elaborate part um, is the headpiece. And you know, dressing the hair was an extremely important element of the way women would dress. Married women would never wear their hair loose. It was always in an elaborate coiffure. And here you've got a very young woman, so there's something in between. Her hair is braided, caught up in um, jewels. But look at that cap with all of the pearls um, and other jewels around it. But I want to focus your attention on that very large pendant that hangs from the, the band of her um, headpiece. And you see that I, I've told you, you can read the enameled motto um, on that, telling you that she is a member of the Sforza family. No doubt left there. Um, let's uh, have a look at one of the men in the Sforza family, Lodovico Il Moro. Uh, he ruled Milan. You see, I've given you the dates, end of the 15th century. His nickname was Il Moro, and you can see that's because he had a dark complexion and dark hair, and he embraced that nickname. He was proud of it, and you see that when he had his initial made with a pearl, he used Moro for it. That was his very particular identity. He wears it in his cap, and I'm going to say more about what a favored place caps were for male jewelry. But here again, we cross genders. Anne Boleyn um, has a very similar jewel that she wears as a pendant. And here we do have um, that similarity, but then highly gendered. Women tended to wear the jewels as pendants or brooches, and men would wear uh, the uh, pins in their caps. He had a longer reign than poor Anne uh, Boleyn. I put that up there just to uh, remind you that she did not last long as queen, um, but she did bring uh, the first of the Queen Elizabeth into the world, and we'll see her, we'll meet up with her in a moment. Let's just kind of refresh our uh, visual palettes for a moment after seeing all of these very um, elaborate jewels and details. What happens when you see two portraits like this? Clearly, these women made it a point not to wear a lot of jewelry in their official portraits. And then we would question. Uh, they're clearly not from the poorer classes who would never be able to have a portrait of this sort made to start with. But what Bronzino does when he gives you a portrait of Laura Battiferi is to show her, I mean, she's very expensively dressed, but very subdued. Um, she is holding a book that she's showing you very, very clearly, pointing out a couple of lines. You can read what's in that book. Um, it's Petrarch's poetry. 
And what she's telling you, or what is being commemorated in this portrait, is that she was a poet. And she was a poet of some renown, uh, married, um, as it turns out, to a very important architect of the time. We're still in Florence with Bronzino um, in this painting. She's got this powerful profile that is not uh, diminished at all. And she is um, happy to show herself in another way. She's got one gold chain, which I'm gonna let you see that a little bit more closely, a costly item, but the lack of jewels is saying, um, again, it's making a gender point. Uh, I'm more like a man in the work I do because there were so many fewer women who were able to uh, engage in an art or any kind of profession. And the painter Sophonisba does this as well. We have lots of self-portraits from Sophonisba, and she shows herself all the time. I don't think there are any exceptions. Dressed in black without jewelry. Uh, wearing black was, especially in the 16th century, very popular for men. So they are making gendered statements in the way they present themselves, and here the lack of jewelry is going along with that. There's a closer view of Laura's um, necklace with a small, it looks like a little gold button, although it's, it's hard to read that in detail. And then Sophonisba um, also uses a book. This, of course, is an attribute of intelligence, of intellectual capacity, and she signs her name there and tells you the date of that portrait. So when we think of jewelry as a luxury item, it also was used um, to uh, mark certain ranks. And I show you these portraits by Giovanna Garzoni from the Dukes, or, or showing you the Dukes of Savoy, because this was, once more thinking now of the gendered aspect, men wearing pendants, but on these very heavy collars that showed their membership in organizations that were generally military and religious, sort of then slash political organizations. So the Dukes of Savoy um, started the order of the Annunciation or the Annunziata, and you can see that on Carlo Emanuele's pendant there is um, a lot of beautiful gold work and then enameled images of the Annunciation. His son is wearing the same uh, collar and pendant, not quite as visible. And that was strictly for men. Women were not uh, members of these organizations, but I wanted to show you the Duchess um, who was married to Vittorio Amadeo because she, in fact, is the one who called Giovanna Garzoni to the court to make these portraits there. Um, you see her in a miniature portrait in Florence, and here's the point. Her insignia uh, ended up being really the pearls, and this is another gendered aspect. Pearls were very closely associated with women, uh, the abundance of them, because they were so costly. Just remember at this point, no such thing as imitation pearls or naturally uh, harvested, um, uh, or you say grown pearls. You know, Mikimoto hadn't done his thing yet. Um, so these are coming from the Persian Gulf and then eventually also some from the Americas. Uh, so these are very costly items, but the fact that they grow in a shell, think of the symbolism uh, for a woman of a womb with something growing in it. Um, the luster, uh, virtue, the whiteness, purity. And in these dynastic marriages, of course, you had to insist on the virtuous chastity of the wife because of uh, you know preserving the family dynasty. So pearls were very powerful signifiers um, of the place, and it was a powerful place, of the woman in these dynasties. Uh, Marie, uh, sorry, Christine Marie also wears a cross um, hanging from one of those pearls, so we see again um, that aspect of the symbolism. And I want to mention this Giovanna with an A, because I've read articles about Garzoni calling her a him, for imagining that it's Giovanni, um, but she indeed um, was uh, valued as a portrait painter um, uh, in the 17th century. All right, insignia, probably the best known one is the cross, the Maltese cross, as we call it. And here you have a knight of the Order of Malta um, who is very dashing, again, um, wearing his armor, wearing that large 
pendant cross slung over his shoulder. Um, and he is definitely voguing a bit for the artist with his family coat of arms up there. So you're told who he is, um, but his great identity is um, being a member of the Knights of Malta. So we have these colors that hang the insignia of the military orders, the religious orders, um, and we see it in a French portrait um, of the, a man wearing one of these emblems from the House of Savoy, connected to the House of Savoy. Notice that he also wears it in his cap. So once is not enough, he's going to wear it on his, uh, as a pendant, he's going to wear it as a cap, badge, and notice that you have lots of little aglets decorating that cap. Here now you're starting to see how important that accessory was for um, aristocratic men. Uh, here we see where they came from. They were pilgrim badges to start with that you would get when you went to certain sacred sites. Um, you can see down on the bottom that they were base metal, um, mass produced to start with. They have the loops so that you can sew them on to your cap. Um, many people would collect them and put them in their prayer books, as you see too. But there you have uh, the soon to be Francis I wearing now a gilded one, a gold cap badge. So they came uh, the route from mass produced to luxury items. And here I'll just give you another example of one of the French kings, um, Louis XII. He's got his badge um, attached in an interesting way with that band going across it in his cap. Um, the order of, uh, San or sorry, paying tribute to Saint Denis, the patron of France. And then on his um, very elaborate shell and ribbon um, gold chain, he is uh, showing you the um, Medal of, of Saint Michael, the Order of Saint Michel, which was one of the most important in the French tradition. And now you can see the level of luxury that these objects have attained. Um, here we have a very um, elegant African gentleman who rose to a high status in Europe as a member of the bodyguard of Charles V, the Emperor Charles V. So he has his portrait painted um, showing that status that he has achieved. He's dressed very elegantly, and you see those lovely gloves that he's wearing. Those were a mark of the gentleman, as was the sword. He's got a jeweled purse at his belt and a cap badge telling you that he went to the site of Our Lady of Hall, and that town was special to the Habsburg family. So all in one, he's telling you, I'm a Christian. I'm a member of Charles V's uh, group. I have status as an important um, soldier in his employ. And um, that, again, we believe he's Christophe Le Lemoore uh, because a man of this um, origin and profession is described in documents. And I think it's a pretty safe um, bet that that is he. Well, let's keep looking at some of the French uh, wearers of these cap badges. Um, this man, as you can see, uh, is not any longer having anything to do with the pilgrimage. He is showing you a young woman in a mythological tradition, um, a figure of, uh, from or based on antiquity, holding the weapons of Cupid. So we have an amorous image in this cap badge. And you see that um, the, that was the best photo I could get, but just to show you that one very similar to the one that's painted exists in the Bargello Museum in Florence. So now we see that movement from a religious origin into a secular one, particularly with love imagery, where men would proclaim their amorous attention and perhaps then have a portrait painted for the um, object of their desire. And uh, before I tell you more about that, this is really just to have you enjoy looking at these two gentlemen by Romanino, who was so skilled at painting the elaborate outfits of these um, wealthy young men from Northern Italy. Um, notice that the fellow on your right is wearing his badge on his sleeve. Um, that's a bit unusual, but once more we see that 
um, there was creativity in the way, way these jewels were worn. Speaking of which, um, look at the, this man from the Burgundian court. We think perhaps he was Charles of Burgundy. We're not entirely sure. But this artist, painting in a very Italianate style, gives us a portrait full of visual detail. Um, look at the cap badge. As much as you can see, it is a, an image of Cupid and Venus, and that sets the tone. Um, notice that I've sort of wanted to give you the impression of going a little bit crazy with all of the lines and so forth. Uh, um, to just show you, this is so full of images to read. And do notice, I'm trying to say this in a genteel way. They're all grouped around his codpiece. And um, there is a reason for that. Um, you've got a ring that he's pointing out to you. You've got a dagger um, with a motto on it, I love no other than you. He's got jewels at the end of his sleeve. Um, he's got a fish biting his finger. We're not entirely sure that why that is. But here you have, again, one of these, you know, too much is not nearly enough uh, sort of images. But all of it is based on making a statement about love. And I truly hope it was presented to the woman um, that he loved um, and or the person that he loved. But we don't have all of that information. All right, let me um, move along and go back to um, the women in power side of the equation. We'll look again at Bronzino, who did so many of these portraits for the Medici court. And particularly, he was really uh, taken up by Eleonora. Um, and then Cosimo was impressed, and he became the court painter. So he makes um, this portrait of uh, Eleonora. Here, despite all of the um, detail of her outfit, her most important accessory is absolutely the young son that is behind, beside her. Right, look at the way that big hand of hers sits on his shoulder. She is showing the viewer that um, she is providing heirs for the Medici dynasty. So she is doing her job as the duchess, eventually grand duchess. And she is um, important because she is assuring the continuation of the rule of that family. Having that status in this case was also connected to a very close working relationship with her husband. And in fact, in 1541, Eleonora was made the regent of Florence, of Tuscany, um, which meant that in the absence of her husband, if he was away for military reasons, for diplomatic reasons, she ruled in his place. And it is perhaps the reason why this state portrait was painted um, with such lavish detail. You can see the jewelry that she's wearing, that giant uh, pendant with the diamond. By the way, these diamonds in this uh, period were mostly table cut. Since they didn't have that many facets, often there would be foil put behind them, so they're a little darker than we're used to seeing. Um, pearls were what Eleonora loved, and Cosimo gave her a very large um, string of them, rope of them. This is probably what we're looking at, um, along with um, all that are uh, woven into her outfit. And I should mention that that beautiful blue that you see behind her was painted with lapis lazuli, uh, obviously a very expensive material, so that in a way this entire painting becomes a jewel itself. Um, these paintings show you that if you were a Medici princess, you were never too young to start wearing important jewelry. And um, little Bia, who uh, is on the left, um, she was born before Cosimo married Eleonora, meaning that she was what we would term an illegitimate child. But that's a very nasty term for little Bia, who you can see was a beloved daughter who was raised in the household with the other children eventually. But poor Bia didn't live a very long life. So uh, this might, in fact, be a commemorative posthumous portrait. Um, one of the things that's important about the jewels that she wears is that pendant with the classicizing profile portrait. And that, indeed, is recognizable as her father, Cosimo uh, the, the Duke. And so he is. Um, 
having the artist uh, through the placement of that jewel absolutely saying she is my daughter, is a member of the family. Notice the earrings that I've shown you in detail from Maria dei Medici, one of Eleonora and Cosimo's daughters, um, look very similar to the ones that Bea is wearing. So here again, these jewels were costly, precious, they identified the family, and so they were shared around the family. Poor Maria also didn't live to uh, a very old age, and um, it gives you a sense of the, the infant mortality uh, at the time. I thought that for the last thing that I discussed, I would follow some of the other uh, members of the Medici family um, and show you in particular their love of pearls. And clearly this became something that identified them not only as women of power, um, many of the rulers wore these pearls, but the Medici in particular became known for them. So Catherine de Medici became Queen of France in the um, just around the second half of the 16th century. And you can see this is a state portrait showing her in all of her splendor. What is singled out here in the middle of those two um, views of the painting is an enormous cross with diamonds uh, down the center and in the arms. It's a little hard to read because of it being um, juxtaposed with that garment that also is filled with pearls, but um, it was given to her by her uncle, the Pope, who brokered the marriage. And he made a few very costly gifts to her at the time of her marriage um, to King Henry II of France. And this one with the pearls hanging from it, giant diamonds in the cross was one that was remarked upon. Also, she had six ropes of pearls that one diplomat said were the largest he had ever seen, in addition to, I think, 25 pear-shaped pearls. So this was part, only part, of what Catherine brought over to France when she became queen. Eventually, another Medici uh, from a different branch of the family, but the daughter of um, the uh, Grand Duke and Grand Duchess. Around 1600, she became Queen of France. And in these uh, portraits, the one on the right repeats that um, prominent display of a cross that if it's not the same one, it's very similar. So I'm imagining that these now went down through uh, the Queens of France or perhaps because of that Medici connection. Notice that it's got a few less pearls hanging from it than that other, the one of Catherine's that I showed you. But you know, they might have been taken off and used for those earrings that she's wearing. So the idea of um, changing these jewels, redoing them, wearing them in different ways was also part of the um, enjoyment of jewelry at this time. As we get into the 17th century, notice that there was another um, style that grew up wearing numerous ropes of long pearls that were caught up in another significant jewel, this a gilded brooch with diamonds. And um, we don't know if those jewels were what, the ones that came from Catherine, but I think uh, at least some of them most likely were. So I'm gonna follow some of these Medici pearls because they had an amazing history. Um, in between the reigns of those two Medici queens of France, Mary, Queen of Scots, became the French queen, very briefly, because her husband um, was a rather sickly young man and died very quickly within the year, I believe, um, of his um, ascension to the throne. But we do know from documents that Catherine gave uh, Mary ropes of pearls from that group that the Pope had given to her. We don't know how many. One account says one large rope, and from those two formal portraits of Mary, it may be that that is what we're looking at. That would make a lot of sense. Now, quickly just moving through what happened to these pearls, uh, you might know that poor Mary was beheaded um, by the order of Queen Elizabeth after having been held captive for a long time. But Queen Elizabeth I, her um, half-sister, also loved pearls. And we again have records that the minute that uh, Mary was decapitated, Elizabeth moved in to take over the jewels 
and you see her wearing some significant pearls in this early portrait. But look what happens when we get to 1588. This is called the Armada portrait, um, showing her um, incredible power after that significant win um, in uh, the sea, the battle in the sea. And she now is wearing more pearls than anyone can count, I think, including all of those long ropes and were, in fact, some of those, the Medici pearls, some of those pear-shaped ones in her coiffure. I'm sure they were uh, thanks to Mary's demise. Well, um, these were so important to the queen that men would wear lots of pearls to show their homage, their tribute to the queen. Here's Walter Raleigh um, wearing not only those beautiful giant pearls in his ears, but his entire outfit is embroidered with pearls in honor of, the, remember, the Virgin Queen. So that symbolism of the purity of the pearls suited her iconography. Um, let's just then follow with that one little tangent on what the men were doing. Um, Princess Elizabeth, the Queen of Bohemia, who was the granddaughter of Mary, Queen of Scots, um, eventually inherited um, numerous bits of jewelry and we think the Medici pearls. Um, you see three different portraits of her and she certainly is emphasizing um, the pearls in all of them. And what happened to them? Well, um, they went over to Germany uh, because these women, um, the Stuart women, married into the House of Hanover. And I'd have to get all of my notes to tell you a chapter and verse because it gets very complicated. But the bottom line is we really don't know how many of those original Medici pearls still existed, how many of them made it back. We know that Queen Victoria was very adamant about holding on to the ones that she could gather. And in fact, they've come down in the royal collection. Um, one um, account that I read says that that pearl necklace with the diamond class, that bottom row, are the Hanoverian pearls, meaning the Medici pearls originally. And that some of the pear-shaped ones um, are displayed in the diadem of the queen. So we see that quite literally, that tradition of pearls for powerful women has made it down into the 21st century. And of course, um, I want to end on our own uh, version of a woman of power wearing pearls. And you know that she has done so much to make them popular um, with or without a lot of historical knowledge of the kind that I've been tracing for you, although I have a feeling with. Because uh, remember that she began wearing these, she tells us, and of course I'm talking about Kamala Harris, I shouldn't just refer to her as she, but our uh, vice president began to wear them um, in solidarity with her sorority sisters. And we are talking about women of color coming together um, to stand beside each other as they um, make their way with their talent and their skills and their determination into the um, halls of power. And uh, Vice President Harris has made it there and she continues that tradition of having pearls as a statement of power now in reality, along with the solidarity of, um, with her sorority sisters. And so I'm joining in, um, you might have noticed, wearing my layered pearls as well. I think it's a great tradition to follow. Um, if you uh, would like to know these great ones are by Alighieri, so I'm doing the Renaissance and modern thing as well. And I think um, I'm gonna just leave you with that um, thought of the tradition that our vice president is embodying in her use of pearls. Um, the final thing I'm gonna do is a little more self-serving. I've had so much fun talking with you today and I appreciate your coming out to listen to what I have to say. If you find that perhaps there's more interest in historical art than you had um, been aware of or if you just love it Anyway, um, I will bring to your attention a book that I'm bringing out. Alex mentioned it. In fact, it's going to appear next week. And if you're interested, you can get a discount for having participated in NYC Jewelry Week, even though this doesn't have to do with jewelry. Maybe the next one will. But thanks so much, and uh, it's been a pleasure to talk with you.